We are at Dixie Diner, Confederate Memorial Day. Got a reenactor out here. And of course, uh, Dixie County Public Library. That's where we meet. <laughs> from the University of Arkansas and the University of Mississippi, uh, Memphis, I'm sorry, University of Memphis. <clears throat> All right. He is on the Shelby County Historical Commission as a past chairman. He's on the board of directors or member of several historical organizations, notably the Tennessee Civil War Preservation Association, board of directors, Friends of Shiloh National Military Park as a past board of directors, the General Nathan Bedford Forrest Historical Society President, Society of the Civil War Historians, and the Stuart Mosby Historical Society. He was a historical consultant for, and Wayne you got some uh, competition tonight, by the way, when you hear this one. He's a historical consultant for 15 Civil War historical movies, documentaries, and TV shows. Uh, for everybody who wants to know what that was all about, Wayne is starting 13? Well, I worked on 14 different movies. Four, four, and, uh, Wayne was the star of 14 different uh, well, I wasn't a star. <laughs> well, not a star. He, he, was, he was in 14 different uh, War Between the State movies. So anyway, uh, back to uh, Mr. Lee Miller. He was, uh, he's a published author. Uh, articles or interviews in 45 major newspapers, magazines, and newspapers. He's a guest lecturer at five universities in the Memphis Shelby County School System. His ancestor, his ancestor is the Grey Ghost, Colonel John S. Mosby of Mosby's Rangers. Uh, Twelve other Confederate ancestors, and unfortunately, well, not unfortunately, one union one. A lot of us have that, including me, folks. I'm sorry I got it admitted to. And uh, is also a descendant of, Net of General Nathan Bed Forrest family. Mm -hmm. He's a longtime Civil War reenactor and leader of the renowned 52nd Regim Regimental String Band. He is a life member of and a regional spokesman for the SCB. He is a recipient of the National SCB Robert E. Lee Award and Medal in 2011, which that, folks, is the second highest award out of national headquarters that can be obtained. Uh, he is also a recipient from the United Daughters of Confederacy prestigious Jefferson Davis Award, which is the highest award that the UBC offers. Uh, he has a Distinguished Service Medal from National SCB Commander-in-Chief and Meritorious Service Medal from National SCB Commander-in-Chief. And Lee led the victorious campaigns to save the General Forrest Monument, the Jefferson Davis Monument, and the graves of General Forrest and Mrs. And Mrs. Forrest. Lee is the author of the book, Forrest Stories, about General Forrest and his cavalry. And later on this evening, after his program, he does have copies of his book. If anybody should wish to purchase one, he would be more than happy and uh, appreciative of that fact. So, with all that said, I didn't know if I could read all that, but I fear not. I would like to introduce y'all to our speaker, Mr. Lee Miller. Thank you, Commander. Um, let me present this forest coin for Mr. Curtis to add to his collection. Well, thank you. Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah. See if there's a, there's a little chat here for for a moment. Um, thank you for inviting me and let me come here. We appreciate the, the invitation. Uh, Daryl flew me in on his private jet from Memphis uh, <laughs> just to be here yeah. today. <laughs> yeah, thank you, thank you. Y'all are probably familiar with uh, General Forrest, but let me give you a quick re review. He was one of the most unique 
commanders in military history, in World War history, studied by a number of uh, military men at West Point, uh, Erwin Bravo of uh, Germany, and uh, Norman Schwarzkopf, who designed his uh, Desert Storm tactics after those of General Forrest. General Forrest started out as a private, rose to the rank of Lieutenant General by the end of the war. The only American to ever do that in the course of one war, from private to general, Lieutenant General, the only one. He was in 120, under fire 129 times. He was in 54 engagements. He won every battle that he was in overall command. When the South was had their backs against the wall and the chips were down, they can count on General Forrest for a victory. He captured over 100 cannons to give to the Confederate uh, military. 30,000 prisoners he captured which kept them away from other generals like Johnston and Lee and uh, others. He captured 3,000 black prisoners and sent them on to the provost marshal. Um, he destroyed about $20 million in supplies uh, that prevented the Union from uh, using those. And he equipped three separate armies of his own from captures, never once asking for the government for, to which he served for sustenance. He captured rifles, horses, saddles, cannons, uh, food, medicine, ammunition, everything to equip, equip, equip thousands of Confederate cavalrymen, all courtesy of the U.S. Army. So, he was clearly feared by the North. In fact, um, when uh, General Sherman and General Grant conferred with President Lincoln about Sherman's march to the sea, Grant told him, he said, you're going to be in the mid-deep south going through Georgia and South Carolina and you're going to be cut off. Aren't you afraid that you'll get trapped down there? And Sherman said, no, I can live off the land as I march to the sea. <coughs> And I can handle toe-to-toe -to -toe the Confederate infantry. But what I fear most is General Forrest will get behind me because he was such a thorn in the Federal side. Um, he defeated four successively larger Union armies, one after another, to keep them from uh, invading farther into the South. Uh, he was just winning all of his battles. He's a, a great man to study. But I bring that up because an incident happened here after the war <clears throat> involving uh, General Forrest and the fear that he generated among his enemies. In uh, one of the houses over here, the, the couple had gone away for the weekend and the place was dark and a thief broke into the house. And... Uh, he had his pillowcase and it was pitch black in the house. And he went to the dining room and uh, started loading the silver into his uh, uh, pillowcase. And then he heard a voice behind him. The forest is watching you. And he looked around and there was nobody, didn't see anything in there at all. And so then the, the thief went into the uh, kitchen and started st stealing the silver, silverware. And then he Pitch black, couldn't see a thing. And then you heard this voice behind him, the forest is watching you. And, and nobody there. Well, so he, he goes into the bedroom, he opens the drawers, he started, started to steal the jewelry and put them in his uh, pillowcase there. And he hears the voice again, the forest is watching you. And he looked around, and there in the corner was a parrot. <laughs> And he says to the parrot, are you named Forrest? And the parrot says, no, but the Rottweiler behind you is. <laughs> so the, the fear of General Forrest continues today. And in fact, it continued to Memphis up until uh, just a little while ago. For some reason, the city of Memphis was deathly afraid of General Forrest 150 years later. 
And so they determined to remove the, the forest statue. It became a target. This happened and uh, started out in, in 2012. Uh, the Forest Camp 215, of which I'm a member, uh, we bought a, a stone for Forest Park there in downtown Memphis. It was about as big as two of these tables. Um, uh, a 3,000 pound stone that said Forest Park on there with the cooperation of the Memphis Park Commission and the Shelby County Historical Commission and put it in the, in the park. Well, the city council didn't like that. They didn't want any advertisement for Nathan Bedford Forest in the city. And so one night in December, late at night, in the dark, they sent a crew over there and they stole the forest stone. And that's what started the whole mess. And then, so, in July, so obviously they broke the law. The, the stone belonged to the SCV with the cooperation of their own park commission and the county historical commission. Um, so, uh, but they decided to do it because they just didn't like anything Confederate. And um, uh, so we sued them and uh, uh, ultimately uh, we won. Tennessee has a, a historical preservation law similar to one in Florida, but actually it's a little bit tighter than that in the city of Memphis broke the law to do it. They didn't care, but they broke it, so that ended up going to court, and we won. And then two years later, the forest statue uh, became uh, a target of the, the Antifas and the uh, BLMs, and you know what BLM stands for, burning, looting, and murdering. Right. And so uh, they, were, they were there protesting, and uh, so the forest statue became a target because it was a symbol of family, country, honor, duty, uh, everything else like that, and which is an antithesis of what they believed in, which was turmoil. So anyway, we couldn't protect the forest statue, and the city police would not protect it. So one night, in the middle of the night, again, the city went there and they took the statue down, which violated a number of laws uh, General Forrest and, and his wife Mary, Mary Ann Forrest were buried directly under the statue. That makes it a grave site. In Tennessee, desecration of a grave site is a felony. Also, there's the family cemetery law in Tennessee. Violating that is a felony. Violating the Tennessee Heritage Protection Act or a whole string of misdemeanors. And so the city violated all this, but they didn't care. They wanted to get rid of Joan Frost. And so, they, so we took them to court. Well, uh, we went back and forth, and they tried to outlast us. I know we had asked for donations from all the camps across the, across the country to fight City Hall. And what City Hall does, if you run into trouble with them, they try to outlast you. They will file motion after motion. Uh, they'll claim you don't have standing to sue the city, which means you don't have the right to, to sue. And we won every single one of those. And so we kept beating them, kept beating them. They, they refused to give in. They wouldn't give us the statue back. They threatened to dig up the graves of General Forrest. And so in the following year, in that next December, we said, okay, we're going to put an end to this. We're going to go right for the drug dealer. Uh, because these crimes were felonies, the city council had voted to authorize the removal of the statue. That means that they intentionally voted to commit a felony, which removes their protection as a government official. That makes them personally liable. Yeah, yeah. So, unbeknownst to them, they and the mayor and the city attorney and the DA and all these people involved were facing felony charges and jail time for taking down the statue, which was the graveside of General Forrest. So, on New Year's Eve, we got the sheriff's department to personally serve the entire city council and the mayor and the city attorney 
and everybody else involved. 18 individuals got summonses on Christmas Eve. Yeah, Merry Christmas Memphis. So, that, yeah. that immediately got their attention, and uh, so that led to a, a, basically they just threw in the towel then. They knew that the SCB was gonna beat them, uh, that we were gonna win, and we did. So we got the statue back, we got possession of the graves, we got all the, everything Confederate uh, in Forest Park. And so, which led to uh, what I'm about to show you here tonight. Um, the question to us became, and we have the, uh, the, the great, great grandsons of General Forrest are in the SCV, they're in the Forest Camp. So uh, we have the Forest family, of which I'm a member as well, and the forest camp, the SCV. Well, what are we going to do? Because we had the problem of the forest statue always being a target. If we put the statue back up, we'll have the same thing. It'll always be a target. And we're afraid that somebody might just blow it up mm -hmm. to get rid of it. And it might be the mayor himself, because they just couldn't stand us winning and being in, in it. So we decided to move it. So we disassembled the, the pedestal, we got the statue back, and we moved it to Columbia, Tennessee to Elm Springs SCV headquarters. We disinterred General Forrest from Forest Park and moved them to Elm Springs as well. And we had the funeral, funeral this last uh, uh, September. So uh, unfortunately, because of, uh, uh, I guess, security restrictions we couldn't have we couldn't make a big deal like we did the Hunley a while ago so uh, anyway we did this let me move around to the other side here Bill, if you'll hold this and let me get to you. all right this is saying this doesn't do that don't work the laptop okay now do this all right so we had the funeral for uh, General Forrest and Elm Springs. But first, uh, the uh, disinterment, there's General Forrest, one of, the, one of the great pictures. There's Forest Park as it used to look. There's the stone that said Forest Park, the 10 feet long thing. That's the thir first thing they stole in the middle of the night. And then the statue, uh, the pedestal, the plaza, the flagpole behind it, etc. So that, and that's how it's going to look when we put it back up at Columbia. There's a good picture. This is on the forest birthday, flying the battle flag in the park. There's the night the city stole the statue, took it off the pedestal. Yeah. Yeah, pretty disgusting thing. So what happens? So we sue the city and we win. So you can fight City Hall if you just outlast them. So then, that's what it looked like for a long time. They put a fence up around it while we were going through court like this, and the tarp, we had, had the tarp over it, and uh, some of the BLMs uh, broke in there and cut up the tarp, and we had it over there so it wouldn't leak water into it. So, uh, but we put it back up. All right. So we decided to disassemble the pedestal and the plaza. Um, and there the, there's the two newer headstones that we, we put up later. But this is the, uh, the pedestal. And we weren't sure what was inside the pedestal. And we, we found out it was brick. And then there, you've got the stone slabs, the granite around there, that we had to take apart and uh, uh, with a, a crane and a tractor trailer truck and all kinds of equipment. We had an archaeologist out there. Oh, good idea. And uh, 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 architect and a, a funeral uh, expert on doing this because it's a grave site. So they were there taking, taking the uh, pieces off. We were taking the first one off. There's the side coming off. That weighs 10,500 pounds. The entire pedestal weighs 40,000 pounds. That's 20 tons. 
this is this is a big deal. It weighed more than I thought, even though we measured and calculated how much uh, you know granite weighs. Um, it was even heavier than uh, the, the scientific calculations. So we took the sides off. There's uh, getting it ready to put on the truck. There's taking the base of the uh, the pedestal off, and there's the brick core. Uh, any construction guys in here, bricklayers, builders, you know that when uh, concrete cures, it is hard as a rock. And that's what happened when this was built in 1905. The, this, the bricks were held by this mortar, and it, we couldn't get it apart. It just turned to solid rock holding those bricks together. So we ended up having to get, a, get the crane and move that entire center to take that apart. Uh, there's uh, one of the yeah, hired hands uh, with the brick center, the brick core. There's the crane and the guys working to take the, uh, the pieces apart. And remember, what we're trying to get to is, is of course, disassemble the forest statue, but we've got to get under the statue because the graves of General Forrest and Miss Forrest are according to the newspapers of 1905, directly under the statue. So that's our objective. One of them is to get under it. So we got the guys out with jackhammers and going after it. Here they're, they're taking, they did the front steps. Uh, and you see the, some of the tiles there. Anyway, they're working away. Okay, there is the frame of the pedestal. And this is the base below the bricks, okay? So we've got to get under that. So we had two guys, two college guys, uh, working, and oh, there's the original, original headstone for General Forrest, under there. And the pieces, but there's uh, one of the jackhammers. It is stuck in that foundation. These guys worked uh, like eight hours a day for three days and this is how far we got down, three inches. That concrete had turned to Mount Rushmore. <laughs> we could not, it was, yeah, it was just, it was a chore to get, to get, dig that up. So we knew we had to get that under it. So we decided we're going to go, and there's another look at the center, and then the concrete slabs that were under the, the tiles on the plaza. You can see the the concrete. So we decided, well, well, let's see if we can get under the front of it. We'll take the steps up. And so there's a load of the steps being moved over to the, and we'll get that torn out and we'll get a backhoe and we'll try to tunnel under the pedestal foundation to get to the graves. So there's the backhoe. He started tearing up the, the, uh, concrete foundation for the steps and we're working and there's a pile of tiles on the left and some more concrete that we're digging up and so we got down to the dirt and the guy with the backhoe was just excellent and he was just scraping the dirt off there even though this is where the under the steps were and you know no chance of really hitting anything there but see this little white thing right there? Yeah. Anyway, he, he scraped across that, and it was a horseshoe-shaped marble, four inches high. And I was standing there with the funeral director as we were watching this, and I said, look at that. He's dug up a toilet seat. <laughs> but it wasn't. Anybody know what a, a Victorian funeral cradle is, flower cradle? It's what you what they used to put in on the graves in the 1900s, and it's an oval, four inches high, it's hollow in the middle, and you plant flowers in it. But because that uh, marble oval is so heavy, it keeps people from robbing the graves. They can't dig under that. So this was placed over General Forrest's original grave in Elmwood Cemetery in 1877, and so. This is under 
what was under the, the front steps. And so we're trying to figure out, well, how did that get there? That's where we're trying to go. There's a foundation that we're trying to get under. Let's see. Yeah, okay. You can't really see. Let's see if I can get. No, it's not like a. Sorry. Um, anyway, so he continues. We got the flower cradle out, and he continues gingerly scraping away the dirt in front of the statue, and we found a burial, burial vault. And that's it right there. You can see pieces of the white. A concrete vault and so now we're really puzzled because all of the newspapers and the speeches of 1905 said we're dedicating this statue to our great general who is whose remains are are beneath this statue so we're thinking we're you know it's supposed to be under the statue turns out this is in front of the statue and oh there's the uh, Flower cradle that says NB Forest, 1877. There it is again. There is General Forrest's burial vault. It turned out to be in front of the statue, which I think would have taken a year to get up. But fortunately, yeah, you can see that on the left, there's the, the foundation. But that's the, the burial, burial vault of General Forrest. So they've got the guys in there with shovels and dig those out and he's scraping some more out. And it had come apart on the end and we see in the end of the vault, it's separated a little bit, there's the handle of the casket of General Forrest. And there we got the, the dirt off of both of them. That's Marianne's uh, casket there. Uh, we're trying to figure out now how do we get under it and lift them up. And so that's the guy in the pink shirt, the funeral director. Um, he's a, a yeah, a master. Yeah, I can't remember his title, but a funeral director. So, all right. So they were there trying to figure out how do we get the vaults up. And anyway, we finally figured it out. We we tunneled under them and got a two by four under it, and then pulled a chain under it, and picked them picked them up. Okay, this is Mayor Rand's vaults in. in Tennessee, and I think in Florida too, when you have, when you rebury a person, you have got to have a new casket and a new vault. General Forrest was buried in 1877, and his vault was reported as being a solid copper casket, which to the newspaper men seeing it, it was copper clad, and it looked like a copper casket. What we didn't know was it was solid iron with a copper cover. It wasn't solid copper. It was solid iron. It was heavy. Marianne was buried in 1893 in a walnut casket with gold and silver trim and a very fine casket. But by 1905, yeah, well, that, so they, when they were transferred from Elmo to Forest Park in 1905, the, both of those caskets went. From 1905 to Last year, her casket had deteriorated almost completely. Uh, there were the silver, silver handles left, but the walnut had just collapsed. Um, but the, uh, so anyway, so we got him to move Marianne to do new uh, casket. We, we immediately put First National flags over both of them. Uh, there is, um, Oh yeah, that's Mary Ann's remains uh, transferred to a new casket and be lifted out to a, 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 a hearse. Our funeral director had two hearse, unmarked hearses standing by. And so when we found them, he called the funeral home and he said, get over here. And they pulled over into the park. We had, you see the green fence back there behind it, security fence. And we put, uh, Mary Ann's casket in one and General Forrest's casket in the other, and we told them, okay, go out the gate, one turn one way, one turn the other way, in case anyone's watching, and drive around for a while till we 
figure you're not being followed and then we'll take them to the funeral home. So just to make sure that the BLM people were not going to cause trouble. So that's Mary Ann's casket. Here's General Forrest's casket. Uh, we, we've lifted out, we're gathering the guys around. We discovered it's solid iron instead of copper. We know it's going to be heavy. So we get six guys and we set it on the ground, get the guys going, and try to pick it up. And we can't. It is so heavy. So we get eight guys and we can't pick it up. We get ten guys to pick up General Forrest casket and that's what we finally do. And there's the hearse right there going in. Yep. That was sorry, wrong. Got that loaded in there. Take it to the funeral home. Um, this is moving the vaults out to the to the truck. Here are the caskets in the funeral home with the uh, flags draped over them. There's General Forrest original casket there. Uh, here is our camp commander Harry Adams on the left. Mike Cross in the middle. One of our our camp adjutant actually and myself there in the funeral home. And there his forest casket, and I don't know if you can see on the top, there's a little silver angel. There were six silver angels on the lid of that casket. And he had to, of course, we had to move him to a new casket. This is the new one, and we inscribed his name on the top uh, edge there. Uh, this is closing up General Forrest's new, well, temporary casket. And there are the, both of them in the temporary caskets. And moving them out. And so this is in July. And we had to, uh, the funeral's in September, so what did we do for two or three months with uh, the remains of the two people? So we had to bury them temporarily so we went to a uh, little known country cemetery out of town and had a temporary burial ground for the forests. And so this was moving them out there to, so nobody would know what we were doing or find out or give us trouble. All right, so now we get to the, the funeral itself. First we had a, a military procession at Chapel Hill the home forest boyhood home and there's the cabin where General Forrest was a, a teenager a young teen and actually he was he was uh, born in, in that there so that's where we're going that's where we're having the first uh, funeral services there's the cavalry for the uh, cavalry procession this was quite elegant this was really one of the finest funerals uh, for any military person ever. Uh, you see the, the hearses and the mech cabin behind the Joan Forrest hearse there. Get up the drive, there's the cavalry again, and the riderless horse signifying a fallen veteran. Part of the cavalry in front of the house, moving the caskets in to the house, reenactors there, uh, other folks there. This is inside, and uh, these are, we moved, had to move the remains to a permanent casket, and uh, this costs us a bit of money. We, we're going to do this right and uh, go first class. And these were the, just the finest caskets you can get, basically. Yeah. They're solid steel, and waterproof, and uh, last forever. And so we got those. And so you notice on General Forrest on the the left side, steel, a gray casket, of course, but has the battle flag engraved 
in the in the handles and his forest engraved picture of forest engraved in the center and the uh, casket flags on top and then on the right hand side is Mary Ann's casket it's white uh, it has her picture engraved on there and the Christian flag uh, draping her casket because she was uh, uh, a very devout uh, Methodist and uh, actually became Presbyterian and got General Forrest to attend uh, and it, he became rather uh, uh, religious uh, went to church you know every every chance he get and there's a, a, another great story about General Forrest and a Yankee chaplain uh, it's in my book uh, so and here's the decorations and uh, the photos of General Forrest and Mary Ann Forrest. This is inside the uh, cabin, Forrest Boyhood home. And the decorations, uh, Jennifer did the uh, decorations there. She's busy writing. Okay, so, all right, there's Mary Ann's casket again, which is just exquisite. And General Forrest's casket. And so this is on Thursday. Uh, Thursday. Friday we took the caskets to Elm Springs to the mansion and they were on uh, viewing Friday and then Saturday morning. Oh, there's the original casket. Uh, that's a, one of the doors. You see the little uh, silver angels that are on there. That's the viewing door and this is the glass. The viewing glass that he had was in there to, when they had the The viewing, the, the visitation, the night before. So he had it out of there. Of course, we couldn't use it again, so we brought it with us and had it on display. All right, here's at Elm Springs, Friday, September the 17th, flags at half mast. There's the uh, the short funeral procession of the drive at Elm Springs to the mansion, and we have the riderless horse leading the way again, and the two hearses. And the ladies in mourning, the uh, OCR ladies and the UDC ladies, uh, dressed in mourning attire, and uh, they carry the photos. Here's inside of Elm Springs, the caskets again with the um, funeral flags, and we have 24-hour guards posted, taking shifts, and everybody could come in. The this is the main gallery, the main hallway could come in and pay their last respects to the forest. And then on Saturday was the actual funeral. Here's the ladies with the photo of General Forrest and then also of Mary Ann coming out of the house to the front lawn where the burial was going to be. Here are the past commanders of the SCV who are the pallbearers for this portion of it. There's are the, the burial vaults, the new ones. And uh, his had on the seal of the Confederacy on top of his name and dates, and hers had on uh, a painting of how General Forrest and Miss Forrest met when they were in 1845, along with names and dates. There's his, the lid to his, and this same thing. Th these are really quite expensive, but you know, you can only bury a, a American general once, hopefully. Uh, and so we wanted to do this do this right so there's Mary Ann's uh, the funeral star there's the crowd about 3,000 people there uh, the 13 gun artillery salute out on the front lawn there after the burial there's the graves with the flowers and the uh, uh, wreaths and all that and there's a Confederate museum behind it. So if you get the chance, yeah, go visit our museum in the background. And then we did the, uh, the cover with the, uh, the later headstones on the forest graves there. And that's how they look today. And then the statue is going to go up uh, directly over that like it was in Memphis. Someday, there's that's one of, one of my favorite shots is General Forrest in the sunset and General Forrest in the fog because that's the way his enemies usually were. 
and a fog. And then there's the photos of uh, Bedford Forest and Marianne that were used for the funeral. And the general with the, the battle flag, the 12 star battle flag. And farewell to the forests. And that's it. All right, any questions? Yes. Did you hit the, uh, the lights? Yes, sir. What happened to the forest statue in Brentwood? The forest statue in Brentwood, that was a fiberglass statue. That's got a really interesting story, too. Uh, the man who passed away, who built the thing, uh, passed away, he willed it to the SCV. Uh, it had been, because it was fiberglass, it really had no strength to it at all. And when it was taken down, it just came apart. Uh, everything came off the legs and the ears of the horse and uh, the, the body of the statue, so it just had to be scrapped. In other words, thanks for nothing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, yeah, it was, a, it was a nice gift, but uh, uh, it just didn't hold up. Yes, sir? Well, congratulations on your legal success with Memphis. Oh, uh, thank you. My question is, is did, was SCB able to recover any of the attorney's fees? Uh, well, the question was, was the SCV able to, return, to recover any of the attorney's fees? Uh, yes, we were. Wonderful. Yes. So, yeah, the city had to pay that, too. Yeah. yeah. Good. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. That is Anybody else? All right. Thank you very much. And uh, if you're interested in my book, I'll have copies of that afterwards. Uh, but now you know a little bit more about General Forrest. Yes, sir. Tentative date or year for the uh, ceremony for that? Uh, the uh, grand unveiling for the statue to go back up will be next year, uh, sometime. Now we've got a, now we're broke because uh, we, you know, had to do the disinterment, disassemble, and the pay for the funeral and all that. So, yeah, the forest camp has no money now. So now we've got to raise money to put the statue back up, and so that will probably take about a year to uh, to do that. So sometime next, a year from now, yeah, we'll be looking for news. All right. How much are the copies of the book? Oh, the book. I've got a hardback uh, is $25 and soft cover is 15 And I'll even autograph them, though. That probably makes them worth less. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Commander, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Lee, on behalf of Camp 1861, we appreciate you driving all the way down here and presenting the program and presenting the program. So, as a little token of our appreciation, a small one, we'd like to present you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Not a, not a yeah. And I, I hope that you don't mind me pointing something out. Sure. Missed, but you missed on your slideshow. What's that? Uh, you know that the forest uh, descendants had a <laughs> limousine ride. Yes, they sure did. Uh, and do you know yes. where that limousine ride came from? Right here. Yeah. yeah. Sure did. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. As a matter of fact, yeah. the gentleman was sitting right there in a Confederate uniform holding that beautiful battle flag. That is Mr. Ben McDonough, the owner of the limousine and the compatriot of this camp. And let me tell you something, folks. I ain't never seen a man handle a rig the way that he did. Because at one point, we had been told to come in the back gate uh, on the day of the funeral service. We had the forest family descendants in the limo. So we're trying to get them in. And suddenly we hit this barrage wall of traffic coming at us. Especially one with and the we couldn't we couldn't go forward. And I'm like, what are we gonna do now? Well Ben says, I'll just back out of here. Well, you know what that driveway was like. Yes. <laughs> it's a challenge. He threw that limo in reverse and just eased right on down, back and around, and then eased it out in the middle of the roadway and he said, we'll go around the front headquarters entrance. And that's what he did. He put it right on around and I'm like where did you learn how to drive, especially a 26-foot stretch of limit? The descendants just wanted to walk through the mud. 
they just go on up there. And I said, we were I know. And the son said, oh, where's the water? I said, no, it's muddy out there. But it was my privilege, really. It was my privilege. I mean, it was a blessing for me. I could have never, so I don't really. We sure appreciate the limo and the service. Thank you for being there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, we waited another year or something like that because the China virus uh, got in the way. Yeah, put it off. Yeah. Oh, anyway, so there you have the, uh, the story of Limo and the services that Camp 1864 was extremely proud to present for that monumental event in Columbia. And I felt very honored to be able to ride shotgun on Limo. <laughs> yes. So, uh, as a matter of fact, I even told Ben at one point, on, a, on an occasion such as this, if you want to just lock me in the trunk, that'd be fine with me. At least I could say I rode with him. But anyway, uh, I'm going to ask Mr. Harry Hurst if he'll come up front for just a minute. That's just what old angel did to you because I from one fellow for God of God. Ben, I'd like to present this to you for the chairman of the limousine. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> That, that was a gift from Harry Hurst. He said it has to go on the limo. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Harry. Thank you. I appreciate it. I need an extra chat, uh, Harry. <laughs> uh, I lost one of my um, air valve caps that had a little bit better than having extras of those. That's right, because the limo is decked out all the way down to the valve stem covers on the tires with the third battle flag. Yeah, so folks, I don't think you can see that limo any more decked out than what it was. I do believe that's about all that I have for the evening. Uh, does anybody on the floor have anything? Any discussions? I do have one that I would like to catch up on. Uh, and especially for this gentleman out to uh, compatriot Lee Miller. And that is the gentleman sitting at the table behind you in the center. That's Mr. John McDerris. And Johnny is known as the Dixie Flag. So, Johnny, how many flags have you now put up? 210. 210 defending flags. <laughs> Go to Flagpole, they don't go in the back of the truck and all that. You want to come to Memphis? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't, because I'd probably burn that place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, any other Appreciate discussion that. from the floor? Commander Barber? Nothing. Uh, yes, sir. I've got a question for Mr. Miller. Uh, would like to how it's coming or what's going to about our little frame, but we had before the uh, pandemic or whatever you want to call it, Biden's folly, and uh, back to the uh, grave side, so the Confederate soldiers and, and uh, the only way to make the cook sandwich. Okay, they're supposed so, to come down, and, you know, right. do all that I, thing. I'm, I'm still waiting on word from Dr. McFadden. Her, uh, her office has been closed, and of course, uh, closed for what, about a year and a half, unfortunately, because of the government intervention. And uh, so her office is just trying to play catch up right now, like a lot of the government uh, offices are in. And of course, uh, they're running about half staff. So that's what the holdup is on the Cook's Hammock Cemetery project. Okay. Anybody else? 